All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Jubilee Encores. And we are going to be showing the film Open Secrets tonight, but first we'd like to give you an introduction of the Jubilee Film Festival and Jubilee Encores. And so our Jubilee Encores represents uh, some of the best of the films that we've shown in the past, those films that had big impact, those films that sparked conversation even after the Jubilee. And tonight we are bringing one of our best. Um, we want to tell you that uh, the Jubilee Film Festival is the official film festival for the Selma Bridge Crossing Jubilee. And this year we are going all virtual. And so we are, we decided to um, kind of test the waters with the new virtual platforms to kind of see what things work best for us and for the rest of the Jubilee. So tonight we're promoting the Jubilee, uh, which will be the first week of March, Jubilee 2020. And you all can go to the website, uh, which is bridgecrossingjubilee.com. And I believe they have some of the schedule up, but of course we're, we're far enough in advance where things are still uh, shifting and shaping. But that that is what we want to um, call attention to. Now, we chose uh, to have our first promotion uh, before the election. And we thought that we should show um, a very, very important film uh, called Open Secret that was put together by our, um, our special guest. And I, I want to introduce uh, Mrs. Melanie Jeffcoat. Melanie is an American actor, writer, and director. She is the co-founder of the critically acclaimed Circle X Theater Company in Los Angeles and has won numerous awards as a theater actor and producer. As an actor, Melanie has recently appeared on TV shows, uh, the, the Passage and Dynasty, in films such as Bigger, Baby Crappy Pants, uh, Paradise, Showgirls, Most Wanted, You're Too Something, and Man in the Glass. She owns Circle X Films, LLC, and continues to write and direct films. She has produced over 20 independent films, most notably the award-winning documentary, Yep, which was part of season three of Real South and is now available nationally on PBS. She wrote, directed, and starred in the award-winning and controversial short film, Open Secret, which won audience favorite at the Politics on Film uh, Festival in Washington, D.C., and then went on to become incorporated into an interactive exhibit on the voting rights at the Tuskegee Human, right, Human and Civil Rights Center. The film was also requested by the U.S. Department of Justice for their voting rights section library. Melanie is the writer-director of the films, Requiem, Wake and Lockdown, which are all slated for 2019 releases. Melanie took a hiatus from all of production and acting for an extended period of time in order to care for her child who became seriously ill and is thrilled to once again have a healthy and thriving daughter and to be back creating and telling stories. Welcome, Melanie. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do a lot of stuff. <laughs> I, I am I am thrilled to be here, and uh, I I don't really want to say a whole lot for anybody that hasn't yet seen this film because I think that uh, um, I kind of my goal with the project was for it to speak for itself and for people to watch it, learn, and hopefully have more questions. Um, it was made uh, really for educational purposes. Uh, and we got a Alabama Humanities grant that made it available in every school and library in the state. Um, now, very few schools will actually show it is what I found. Um, so, uh, you know, we're still working on, on that. But um, basically, uh, just as a brief intro, Nancy Eckberg, who will be on our panel, uh, uh, I met at a, a, a women's, uh, oh my gosh, my brain is tired. Um, Take your time. The voting rights group. And uh, she informed me that this Alabama constitution had transcripts. And I found it fascinating that these 
men wrote down what they said. And so she was able to get me a copy of the transcripts and asked if I would create something based on the words that these men said as they discussed this constitution at the convention. And then uh, Marika Coleman, Representative Marika Coleman, um, uh, sort of urged me on and helped me uh, get a little bit of fundraising to, to get this sort of low budget project completed. So um, it, the, the words are somehow uh, somewhat offensive in this film, but they come directly from the transcripts um, because when the, the laws on the books are one thing, but knowing the context of those laws based on the conversations these men had about the laws uh, was to me infinitely fascinating because some people knew what they were doing wasn't right. Um, and I think that that uh, is sort of where we're still in that sort of struggle today that that people are forging ahead with things that they just know are not legally or ethically right. Um, but it's all about power and it's all about fear um, and money. So, um, you know, a lot has changed and nothing's changed in 115 yes. years. So I, I think that um, one thing I, I did want people to just have the, in their mind as we are watching the film is, is right after this convention, there were lawsuits um, and uh, about voting rights that, that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, they were not successful, but shortly after that, was when a lot of these big Confederate monuments started going up, some of which we saw get pulled down recently. So I think it's important to know that that right after this, as as Black voters were pushing back, uh, you know, the the literal like uh, tributes to white supremacy were being built across this state as sort of like a, a stake in the ground, saying this is this is where you know it took 115 years for for at least one of those to come back down again. So. Um, just for a, a sense of time, um, yes. that's the context of this piece. So that's all you really need to know. It's, it's really based on the conversations that some of those men had, uh, condensed from three months to 30 minutes. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> this could have been a, a very long mini series. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. And, um, I, I chose to have a narrator throughout the film to sort of explain a little bit of the context with each block that you'll be seeing tonight. Um, but I'm sure people will have questions and we can discuss it in the panel. So I'm excited, very excited to be here that this film has still has some some resonance out there. Um, yeah. It makes me hat and happy at the same time. So it's like, you know, we we shouldn't be discussing this anymore, but we are. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we are having some technical difficulties with the guests trying to get onto the Zoom. So I'm going to put the film YouTube address in the chat. If you have difficulties watching it on Zoom, please use the, the YouTube link. In fact, you'll do better using the YouTube link. But I'm going to do a screen share. And then you can also, like I said, click on this link in the chat. Hold on one moment. I need to grab and the it. and the film is about 29 minutes 30 minutes so for anybody feeling like how much time am i going to be sitting here on this screen um after once we start after 30 minutes we can all come back if you watch it on youtube yeah. okay so the time it's a 6 13 so we'll plan to come back here at 6 45. And I just posted the link. So I see time, we're going to get started. I'm going to, and if everybody, if you could put your video on mute and, and put your audio on mute while we're watching the film, that is going to help um, the, film. the film broadcast from the Zoom. So we'll check back in a half hour. It is summer, 1901 in Montgomery, Alabama. Delegates from every county, all men, all white, set out to write a new state constitution. 
The newly elected president of the convention, the Honorable John B. Knox, set out to clarify the most pressing issues of the convention. Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, in my judgment, the people of Alabama have been called upon to face no more important situation than now, unless it be when they were forced to decide whether to remain in or withdraw from the Union. Then, as now, the Negra was the prominent factor in the issue. The Southern people with the grave problem of the races to deal with are face to face with a new epoch in constitution making. Now some of our northern friends <laughs> have ever exhibited an unwanted interest in our affairs. It was their interference that provoked the most serious conflict of modern times, the war between the states. So long as the Negro remains an insignificant minority, our friends in the North tolerate him with complacency. But there is not an intelligent white man in the North, not gangrened by sectional prejudice and, and hatred of the South, who would consent for a single day to Negro rule. Yeah. Just three days into the convention, President Knox received a letter from Booker T. Washington, founder of the Tuskegee Institute and one of the most respected and influential black men of his time. Dear sir, I very much hope you can see your way clear to have this letter read to the convention. It could not be expected that the 800,000 colored people in this state would not have some interest in the fundamental law under which both races are to be governed. The Negro asks that since he is taxed, works the roads, is punished for crime, is called upon to defend his country, that he have some humble share in choosing those who shall rule over him. You have the power. The world will watch as you act. Gentlemen. We need to establish white supremacy in this state. But if we would have white supremacy, it must be by law, not by force or fraud. It will enable us to protect the sanctity of the ballot in every portion of this state. Manipulation of the ballot that has occurred in this state has been the menace of Negro rule. We cannot be too careful in creating a system of voter registration that will eliminate the class of voter in whose hands the right to vote is a menace to good government and good morals. If the convention does that, its work will command the respect of patriotic men everywhere. Mr. President, this government was founded by white people. Its institutions have been preserved and enforced by the white race of this country. It is only in recent years that the Negro has become a qualified voter in most states the percentage of such voters is so small that uh, his influence is not felt. It's only in the southern states where he has become an important factor and with today's current laws a menace to our civilization. Now, this conclusion is not drawn on any prejudice toward the Negro. Now, Mr. President, I am not ashamed to admit that I myself, as my ancestors before me, have been slave owners. My great granddaddy put at risk his very life to help secure the validity of the Constitution of the United States. We felt sure, as did they, that they had the right to consider such persons as property, as secured by the 
organic laws of this country. We're marching on to freedom land. We're marching on to freedom land. God, our strength. The 15th Amendment is one of the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution and was ratified in 1870. This amendment made it illegal to deny the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. These delegates, wanting to avoid federal intervention, had to find a new way to disenfranchise the black voter. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. Now, the Supreme Court of Mississippi says here, Restrained by the federal constitution from discriminating against the Negro race, the convention discriminates against its characteristics and the offense to which its criminal members are prone. And it is even stated that, and I quote, the right of suffrage is not a natural right. Mr. President. Mr. Vaughn. We could simply adopt the use of literacy test in order to limit voting rights. <laughs> but it would need to exclude not just illiterate and incompetent immigrants, but the illiterate and incompetent Negro as well. That way, the Negro is discriminated against not on account of his race, but on account of his intellectual and moral condition. There is, as you know, a difference between an uneducated white man and an ignorant negro. <laughs> there is in the white man an inherited capacity for government, which is wholly wanting in the negro who is descended from a race lowest in intelligence. We are talking about the principles of inherited capacity. It's recognized even in the Bible. Now, some have urged that a reason why this move for a new constitution should be defeated is that we propose to adopt a suffrage plan that will offer to the Negro an incentive to obtain an education, while the child of a white man will be without a lack stimulus because he is protected in his right to vote without regard to the density of his ignorance. Now, this does not extend beyond the voters now living, correct? I would rather this right hand of mine become palsy before it would write disenfranchised to the grandson of a confederate. To clarify, gentlemen, we are pledged not to deprive any white man the right to vote. But Mr. Coleman, provisions in the Constitution that prescribe educational qualifications for voters are a noble stimulus to the acquirement of an education. And we must fight ignorance as we would fight malaria. We ought to teach the Negro to, to read his Bible, to understand the laws he is to obey, to understand the contract that he signs. But it is only by educating its people that a state can gain and maintain a proud position amongst the nations of the earth. Uh, and with that, in an effort to limit blacks and ironically many poor whites from voting, the convention incorporated literacy tests, cumulative poll taxes, and unreachable registration requirements. It was not until 1964 that the 24th Amendment outlawed poll taxes, but Alabama would not ratify this amendment until 2002. In the continued effort to keep Alabama separate but equal, the delegates also debated whether blacks and whites being schooled together should be outlawed in the Constitution. Mr. President, the whites shall have a school district of their own and the Negro a district of their own. That is the old Southern idea that the Negroes shall go to school together, separate and apart from the whites. I mean, we do not want to see a time. I hope to God I never see it come when they will mix and mingle in the schools of the South? Mm. Now look, we are we're dealing with conditions which will affect our children. And our children's children, but the, the race is here. Cannot be transplanted, cannot be deported. They are part of our economic system. And they are being educated very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Now someday when the 
separate and distinct races are thrown together, it's going to be survival of the fittest. And I do not think it incumbent upon us to raise the Negro up, educate him, put him on equal footing when that combat comes. Mr. Long, if we teach the Negro that while it cannot rule us that his interests, his prosperity, his happiness are things for which we care, when they are convinced of this, they will be a contented race. They will be glad to be with us. The Negro was a slave for a hundred years and has only had his freedom for 35 years. Here, here. Now it is too soon a time after slavery to throw upon him the responsibility of working out his own salvation. On the other hand, if he is convinced that the white man hates him and intends to oppress him, let that idea grow with him for generations. Bar him of opportunity to improve. Deny him rights as a human being. His condition will grow worse and worse. And such a policy on our part will bequeath a legacy of perpetual race hatred. If we do not lift them up, they will drag us down. I simply ask if it is right to tax whites to educate the Negroes of Alabama. To ensure that blacks did not surpass whites in education, the delegates approved Article 14, which states, separate schools shall be provided for white and colored children, and no child of either race shall be permitted to attend a school of the other race. The effort to remove much of these and other segregationist provisions from the Constitution was defeated as recently as 2004 by Alabama voters. Now, Section 62 states, the state legislature shall never pass any law to authorize or legalize any marriage of any white person and Negro or the descendants of a Negro to the third generation inclusive, though one ancestor of each generation be a white person. Mr. President. Mr. Vaughn. I have an amendment to offer to amend section 62 by striking all words following the word nigra as it occurs the second time in the second line. And what would be the effect of such an amendment? This amendment simply would prevent Negras from marrying white people at all. Period. Mr. President. Governor Oates. This language is already in the penal code of this state and has been for a long time. I think it is properly in the Constitution as a policy against miscegenation and in favor of race separateness. Gentlemen, if you adopt this amendment, it is an open question as to how far the descendants may be traced and to what generation, leaving the entire thing in a state of uncertainty. It is my judgment that as currently written, it is as far as we ought to go. Without such an amendment, sir, it would be possible to legalize the marriage between a white person and the descendant of the Negro to the fourth generation. <laughs> I haven't known or heard of any marriage in this state between a white person and the descendant of a Negro. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, we have these people among us here clearly an inferior race. And I think the laws that we have lived under go far enough in our Constitution. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, I have an amendment too. To amend section 62 by adding to the second line after the word negra, the words Chinese and Indian. <laughs> now, I don't wish to make a speech on this. Thank you. Just think that Indians and Chinese are sorrier than Negras and, 
You know, I just think they ought to be included in there. The amendment to include Indians and Chinese was tabled, but they did clarify that the legislature shall never pass any law to authorize or legalize any marriage between any white person and a Negro or descendants of a Negro. If the men should see the women going to the polls. By 1901, 25 states had given women partial suffrage, and four states had already given them equal voting privileges to those held by men. Armed with a letter from the National American Woman Suffrage Association, a woman by the name of Miss Frances Griffin, president of the Alabama Auxiliary of that group, was hoping to address the convention. This group of men, most of them lawyers and judges, would have preferred to have been done for the day. But rumor had spread, and women from across the state had filled the chamber that day. After a vote, they decided to let her speak. No matter how modest the Constitutional Convention nowadays, some female suffragists find it out and insist on making a speech. Gentlemen. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. That thought is the guarantee of liberty. But let me remind you that women, as well as men, belong to the governed. You see, government interferes with women exactly as it interferes with men. She touches the government all the way along her life, and should she not just have a share in it? Mr. President, I live in a household of women, <laughs> of educated women, <laughs> widows. There is not a man on the face of this earth interested particularly in the affairs of our household. We have no more voice in our own neighborhood than if we were a family of Americans set down in Russia. If there were no other reason why women should want to vote, it would be to avoid being classed with traitors, idiots, criminals, and with children. If there were no other, there would be the demand for justice and full equality before the law. Look abroad, gentlemen, at the great army of wage workers today and see the women, the mothers, the sisters. And you know that it is the struggle of the fittest, and the weakest are still further handicapped by the lack of any voice to regulate the laws that crush her. Women ask for the ballot for the same reason men have enjoyed it, for self-protection. And so long as there is one woman in the state of Alabama that wants the right to vote, she is, according to the spirit of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, entitled to that right. Now, we do not ask for the ballot because we think men unjust or unfair. And we do not ask to speak for ourselves because we think men unwilling to speak for us but because men, by their very nature, never can speak for women, ever. So long as laws affect both men and women, men and women together should make those laws. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. A vote to include a women's suffrage provision failed passage. The delegates were determined in their belief that women were unsuited for politics. It will be almost 20 years before the women of Alabama would gain the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Alabama rejected its ratification at the time and did not ratify it until 1953. I present a minority report. With regard to the expense of a stenographic record of the full proceedings of this convention, 
I do not believe that it is expedient, nor do I believe the people of Alabama should incur the expense. Joe, I am in favor of a full public report as it will throw light into the future as to the true interpretation of this Constitution. I cannot concur. When this work is tested before the Supreme Court of the United States, we do not want them to search for light amid the darkness of our debates on the 14th and 15th Amendments. The publications of the speeches and debates will be of great value in educating the people to the needs of a constitution. The of this state is in favor of our movement. And if we give good reasons, they will be given the widest circulation by our patriotic the, editors. Every word is recorded. It will bring dignity and solemnity to the discussion. I disagree. I believe that this full report will repress discussion. I move that the minority report be substituted for the report of the majority. Sirs, ours is a government of the people, and we are here as their representatives. This minority report assumes that there are men in this hall who do not stop to weigh the force of their remarks. I know that the speeches that will be made here shall be speeches of which we shall not be ashamed. Why should not the state of Alabama stand in the forefront of progress when the question of progress arises? I rise in favor of the minority report. Now, I believe that we should have a record of what we do, but I do not believe that we should have a record of what we say. Suppose, for instance, that one of the delegates were to say that no one should be allowed to vote except white men. Now, I believe violations of the 14th and 15th Amendment are but political crimes, and it would take very little for me to vote in favor of an amendment to the suffrage clause that said nobody but white men should be allowed to vote. However, I do not believe that'd be very good reading when the Supreme Court of the United States came to pass on the constitutionality of this here convention. <laughs> I'm not afraid to speak my sentiments at any time, but I do not think we should have a political record of it there in black and white. Well said. Let the people of Alabama see what has been said and done. I think it would be unwise for this convention to hide what it does under a bushel. I see no reason why we should not take the people into our confidence. Let them look into our hearts and see once and for all our motives. I am not afraid to publish my views on suffrage to this state or the world and do not believe that this high-minded body will adopt or propose a constitution that it would be ashamed to publish. There is not a man on this floor who believes in the publicity of our actions more than I do. But it is not necessary that it should be put down in black and white. I have no desire in the years to come to point to any of my fellow citizens and say, you made this and this mistake in the years that have gone by. <laughs> the gentleman seems to think that 20 years from now, some speech made at this convention will be seized upon by critics. <laughs> <laughs> but we need never fear the truth. A century from now, when the world has grown wiser, when the real reasons for solving this crisis have sunk deeper into the hearts of men. They shall say with unanimity that the sovereign white people were right. Mr. President. Mr. Vaughn. It is an open secret in Alabama that the majority of our people favor eliminating the Negro from politics, but without interfering with the rights of any white man. Now, while I agree we should take into confidence every citizen of Alabama, I hold the view 
that outside the confines of our state, nobody has got anything to do with our business. Gentlemen, the same discussions that convince the members of this convention to propose and adopt a constitution will convince the members of this state to ratify the constitution. I am heartily in favor of going on record, not only as to what we do, but as to what the motives are that inspire our actions. There is no record that this was done at the last convention, and I see no reason why it should be done now. I shall vote for the minority report and hope the majority of delegates will do the same. Mr. President, Governor Oates. If we wish for the people of Alabama to act intelligently on this Constitution, we need to keep them posted day by day. We need to take the people into our own confidences. Let us assign our reasons. Let them read them. And upon the justice of our cause and whatever action we conclude, let us be men and stand by it. It is too small for the Constitutional Convention of the state of Alabama to undertake to try and hide or cloak anything. Let us assign publicly to the world whatever reasons we have for the actions we shall take. And I feel satisfied that we will never regret it. The majority opinion was adopted, which made available for public record every word you've just heard. All right. Looks like everybody has completed watching the film, at least those that I can see.
And we are resolving the technical issue. The Zoom link was not working for most of the people who registered who I don't have in my phone list. So we're waiting for them to receive the new Zoom link. But we're going to continue on and we're going to begin introducing our panelists at this point. Okay, so we have with us to start off with um, Miss Norma Ayaba Day Jackson, fan favorite of the town of Tuskegee, a Tuskegee native. Uh, Norma McGowan Jackson is a retired public school educator, founder, and director of the Bo. Am I going to say it right? Boabab. Boabab. There you go. Journey Rites of Passage for Girls and a founding member of the core group of Infinite Possibilities. She received a BS degree from Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, in 1978, and her Master's of Education from Auburn University in Montgomery, 1987. Norma was employed by the Macon County Public Schools uh, school system for 25 years as kindergarten teacher at South Macon Elementary School. Since her retirement in 2003, she has served as director of Tiger Tots Daycare Center in Opelika, Alabama, and has recently retired from Lee County Youth Development Center, also located in Opelika. Since 1996, Norma has served as chapter coordinator for the, how do you say Amandla. that? Amandla. 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 Okay. You messing me up out here. Amandla chapter of 21st century youth leadership movement. 21st Century is a grassroots organization headquartered in Selma, Alabama, and dedicated to developing community-focused leaders through the LACES philosophy, which is leadership, academic, culture, economics, and spirituality. In August of 2020, Norma was elected to the Tuskegee City Council for District 1. She hopes to be the catalyst for the revitalization of the community where she was born and raised and continues to reside. Married to her high school sweetheart, Grover Jackson, uh, senior for 46 years, Ms. Jackson is the proud mother of two adult children and the proud grandmother of 10 amazing grandchildren. So welcome, Norma, and thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. We also have Miss. Now, I want to say this right, and you all can see that I'm a bad reader, but my wife makes me read anyway. Is it Marika or Marika or Marika? Marika. Marika Coleman. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Is a member of the Alabama House of Representatives representing District 57. Hold on, wait. That's not the one you sent me. Sorry about that. I have two of them. <laughs> okay. Um, so you were elected to the Alabama House of Representatives in 2002 and is serving your fifth term as a member of the legislative body. Currently mm -hmm. serves as a lifetime, I'm sorry, uh, currently serves as a member of the leadership of the 105 member body as the assistant minority leader, the first person ever to serve in this position. Representative Coleman is a member of the powerful judiciary committee that creates and develops all criminal and civil laws in the state of Alabama. In addition, she is the only female member of the banking committee and, and is a former member of the Ways and Means Committee that develops the budget for all Alabama State Departments. Previously, Representative Coleman served as chair of the Boards and Commission Committee, one of the only three women of the House of Representatives that served in leadership at the time. In addition to Representative Coleman's two degrees from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, a Bachelor of Arts in Communications and a Master's of Public Administration, she completed her Doctor of Jurisprudence from Birmingham School of Law and was a member of the 2017-2018 graduating class, graduating with honors. Professionally, Representative Coleman presently serves as an Assistant Professor of Political Science and Social Justice Initiative Special Assistant at Miles College, located in historic Fairfield, Alabama. In addition, she is the owner of the law offices of Marika Coleman, LLC, a law firm specializing in criminal and family law, as well as estate planning. She is also the founder of the Derek Richardson Foundation, 
a foundation created in honor of her late husband who passed away this February. Nationally, representative is sought after um, <clears throat> is a sought after legislator by many women and political groups for her ideas on a range of issues such as the role of black women in politics, health care reform, reproductive rights for women, pay equity, economic development, defense spending, and common sense gun regulation. She has made appearances on the Rachel Maddow show on M MSNBC and Reverend Jesse Jackson's nationally recognized show, Keep Hope Alive. Representative Coleman has been recognized by numerous organizations for her commitment to the poor and improving the quality of life for all Alabamians. Most recently, she was inducted into the UAB MPA Program Hall of Fame for her contributions to public service. She was honored by the Boy Scouts of Alabama for her commitment to youth and acknowledged her place in Alabama political history as the youngest woman ever elected to the Alabama legislature. She was first elected at the age of 28. Although politically and professionally, she has accomplished many things. Her greatest accomplishment is the role of mother. She is the mother of Alexia, who was a member of the 2019 graduating class of Vanderbilt University. Alexia is currently a field director for the Alabama Democratic Party responsible for voter education and engagement. Her son, Xavier, is a sophomore business major at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, was also a member of the Blazer football team. Welcome, Ms. Coleman. Thank you. As Melanie said, that was too many words. <laughs> but you know, we have some technically technical difficulties. I'm trying to give people a chance to jump on with us. And those are important words. We really appreciate the accomplishments. Next up, we have Ms. Lisa Tolbert. Welcome, Ms. Tolbert. Lisa Tolbert is a environmental health scientist and public health practitioner who currently works as the partner engagement program manager at the Climate Action Campaign. In her role, she leads a highly visible, highly effective campaign and activities that engage Black American um, faith, environmental justice, and youth-based organizations to demand action and legislation on the global climate crisis. Elise is also the founder and CEO of Next Step Up, a nonprofit organization that empowers high school students to pursue their dreams by providing mentoring and tutoring. Ms. Tolbert lives by the motto, blaze your own trail which reminds her of her responsibility to follow her heart and create a path for others. She's a native of Tuskegee, Alabama, and is committed to improving community, particularly those of color, by improving the quality of education, health, and environment, thus improving the quality of life. And we have been seeing her all over the community, registering people to vote. She has been beating that drum. So we appreciate you, Elise. Welcome to the Jubilee Film Festival. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today. And I want to introduce somebody very special. I did not know how special when we first started, but I am learning. And so first I want to just give you the context to Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform and its foundation. The ACCR Foundation are part of a larger umbrella organization of 30 organizations called Constitutional Convention Coalition, who are all working to bring a new constitution to Alabama. They are grassroots, nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations of citizens that recognize our 1901 constitution is a racist document that embodies an unfair tax system and restricts county governments from carrying out the wishes of their residents. <clears throat> Their goal is to reform the Constitution by allowing the people of Alabama to vote on holding a constitutional convention to write a new Constitution. You can go to their website, www.constitutionalreform.org, to find out more about them and join their effort. And today we have with us Ms. Nancy Egbert, who is a board member and communications chair for the Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Reform. She has a BA in journalism from the University of Minnesota. And in a previous life, she was a reporter for newspapers in the Midwest, executive director of Magic Moments, Alabama's wish organization for Alabama children with life-threatening illnesses, a board member with the League of Women Voters, 
and curriculum chair at the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Alabama Birmingham branch. Welcome, Ms. Egbert. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to turn this over. All right, and I do want to acknowledge we have two panelists who were not able to join us. That would be State Senator Malika Sanders Fortier and Dr. Sherry Bevel. I'm not sure if she will be joining us, but if she does, we will give her her introduction at that time. So thank you all for watching this film with us. Um, some of you may have been familiar with the 1901 Alabama State Constitution, and for others, this may have been your first introduction to it. And it's the year 2020, and it is still the Constitution in the state of Alabama after all of these years. So we're going to start asking our panelists some questions about the film and the Constitution. And I'm going to start by asking the film producer, Melanie Jeffcoat, First, why was white supremacy established as law in Alabama? That was in the film, but if you could just put it into language of our modern times, why did they do that? Um, well, after 1870, when the 15th Amendment was was passed and ratified, allowing you know black men the right to vote, um, <clears throat> that was a tech. Technically, they were allowed to vote. Uh, but they were finding ways to keep them from doing it. It was illegal um, and fraudulent. And John Knox at the convention acknowledged that, you know, we have been winning through fraud. Uh, so, and that just isn't right. And people are going to start calling us out on it. So the best way to, to, there's two things you can do. You can stop the fraud or you can make fraud legal. And so they opted to make fraud legal. Sound familiar? with what we're seeing right now. Um, so uh, that is essentially uh, why they, they, the only way to sort of legalize that fraud was to establish white supremacy as law. Um, and that sort of gave them the legal out to disenfranchise, you know, what was hundreds of thousands of, of black men. Thank you. And I would like to know, and this can be for anyone on the panel, uh, before the 1901 Constitution, um, you mentioned fraud. Um, what were some forms of voter suppression? Fraud was one. I know there was some violence, but can anyone speak to what this actually looked like before 1901? Well, I, I can say uh, uh, that, that the Klan basically would, on the day of registration, would drive through town uh, with ropes on their horses and say, hangings in 15 minutes. So that, that was their way of basically clearing out, you know, people having to question, well, is it really worth me dying today? So, um, you know, violence was a very large lynchings, beatings, violence, um, kept people from practicing their constitutional right. They sound familiar, huh? Again, history repeating itself. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna jump in and say the same thing because we're hearing now of um, the ability to open carry at polls um, right. as a voter intimidation, intimidation tactic. There are voter mm -hmm. polling places where there are Confederate flags on private property right next to a polling place. Um, so very, mm -hmm. very relatable for these times. Yeah, not to, not to mention also just the disinformation campaign. Yes. It's been going on throughout social media, um, which, you know, of course, our intelligence community has validated that indeed um, other people have been, other countries has been dibbling and dabbling um, into our elections. But there has been such a huge, I don't know, chatter um, in communities of color uh, trying to keep people um, from actually going out to vote. So very relevant today. Mm -hmm. And one thing um, that I read about in the history books, there were actually massacres at the different polling places in Alabama. It was happening in other places in the country, but I know it happened here in Alabama. I know there was one in Greene County at the courthouse. And I don't know how many voting related massacres there were, but that would definitely be good for us to know about in terms of our history lessons. 
Well, and, and that's why that, you know, when when the, the president said, you know, stand by to the Proud Boys um, <laughs> for anybody that studies history. And it's a whole other another story that we need to have, have an American populace that's well versed in their own history because we will stop repeating it. But for a lot of people, probably a lot of people on this panel, when they heard those words, what they thought about was was 1901. What they thought about was that was a, not even a veiled threat to to block the vote, and um, it was terrifying. And as it related to the voting fraud, um, they had different techniques that they would use to to change the ballot. Uh, I remember reading one quote: "You vote the way you want to vote." We count the votes the way we want to count the votes. <laughs> so that's one example. I, I know there were accounts back before the 1901 Constitution of dead residents voting in different precincts. So it seemed like there was a whole toolbox of establishing this voter fraud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you think the like governor's race. So somebody was going to say something else. No, I was just saying, I think the governor's race in uh, Georgia, the last governor's race in Georgia was a prime, it was a playbook for how to, to steal an election. Mm -hmm. And Representative Coleman, were you trying to say something? I was commenting on um, the, 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 the film itself and the last part of the film, if you stayed all the way to the credits and it talked about in certain black belt counties, more people voted than they're actually registered to vote. That's fraud. That's a, you know, that's live and live in color fraud. And then in addition to the uh, realization that all of these supposedly people of color, these black men voted against their own interest. So we know someone else stole their vote. That was not them voting against their, their own interest. Someone else did that to them. And you know, when I was doing research for this film, I was at the Department of Archives looking through newspapers from the day, uh, you know, leading up to the ratification and, and the day of the vote. <clears throat> and Booker T. Washington was actually in Montgomery and all through the Black Belt, yeah. urging Black voters not to ratify this constitution. He was actively engaged with voters. So there's just no way to believe that any Black man was gonna go to the polls to never do it again. It just was not, it's not, that did not happen. And that, you know, and, and most of the other counties, uh, as you probably saw in the film, a lot of the other counties did not ratify it. Oddly enough, it was in the black belt where those, those votes were, were stolen and forged or whatever they did, but those, those men did not vote to never vote again. Oddly enough, yeah. thank you so much. And hold on, we have a question from the chat. Yes. <clears throat> from uh, Sharice Holt to everyone. What party, Republican or Democrats, were responsible for these voter suppressions during these times? Well, this is, a, I, I've had to battle this so many times because people will tell me, well, it was the Democrats that were the racists. And, and again, history, history, history classes need to be imperative for everybody because at the time uh, that this was happening, the Republican Party, uh, the party of Lincoln, were basically the progressive, mostly the black, you know, uh, legislators and, and voters. Um, the Democrats were sort of the party of white supremacy. Um, <clears throat> that switch, that party platform switched, uh, I believe, after uh, Lyndon Johnson um, was basically told, you know, you just have lost the South forever and they have sort of switched. So I think it switched with, uh, uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, yeah. I believe. Yeah. So the Republicans of today were the Democrats of 1901. So the Republican platform of today was the platform that, that was fraudulently, basically the Republicans haven't changed the name, but not the philosophy. And, and let me say this, um, just as a reminder, um, this pandemic, COVID-19, has really changed things. Um, normally, at our film festival, these are some of the discussions that, that will be had among the audience and the participants, and it would stay within the boundaries of the theater. But now that we are online, technical difficulties aside, this is being recorded. 
So this is going to be shared. So this 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 will not stop here. So I want to encourage uh, Norma, if you could amplify on your statement about President Roosevelt. Yeah, so we know that Herbert Hoover was the Republican president at the beginning of the Great Depression. And so when Franklin Roosevelt uh, was elected to office and created the New Deal and all of these programs that were beneficial to uh, African Americans and poor people in general, there was a shift from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And I think that we have seen that progression from Roosevelt to Kennedy, um, you know, on through Obama, uh, of Black people's allegiance to what we now know as the Democratic Party. Thank you, and thank you, um, Sharice Hope, for your question. And I want to look now at after the 1901 Constitution, what did the methods of disenfranchisement look like after the Constitution was passed? Uh, well, um, and tell me to shut up. I'm just jump jump in there. But I'm about to talk to um, I was waiting on Nancy to get in as well. <laughs> it, I mean, it, part of the what they did in that summer of 1901 was create many many obstacles, including the literacy tests, um, with the uh, a poll tax, which which adults have to register. Yeah. yeah, it's just the property requirements, uh, job requirements, things that were just made it. Uh, nearly impossible for a majority of, of uh, not just black men, but poor white men uh, to be able to access the ballot. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Nan Eckberg a question now, just in terms of the 1901 Constitution. It's the largest constitution in the whole world <laughs> and the longest. It's the biggest and the longest constitution. Can you explain why our constitution is so long? Yes, it's 345,000 words. Uh, and today, before we vote next week, it is 947 amendments. And it is, uh, the US constitution has 27 amendments. So that has to tell you one of us is doing something wrong. <laughs> but it, the reason is, <clears throat> because it does not allow counties to have home rule. And what that means is uh, cities and municipal are municipalities. Cities are incorporated and they have the right to do for their constituents what those constituents need for governance. Counties do not have that right. So that they have to go to the legislators to hat in hand to beg them to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot to allow them to do things like spray for mosquitoes or pick up dead animals or establish a water district or amendment to amend an amendment to amend an amendment to amend amendment. And then they had one to get rid of the boll weevil and that one worked. So that's the only one that really was working. But the amendments <laughs> were ludicrous. They were the kinds of things, you know, to, to name a constable, uh, a sheriff, those kinds of things to decide whether you could give a badge to um, a deserving member of the sheriff's de delegation. It, it's un unreasonable things that any city or small town is allowed to do because it's incorporated, but the counties cannot do that because they are considered part of the state and they are under the control of the legislators. And I know Marika Coleman knows this only too well, that they spend probably, I would, she can give me a clear answer, but probably 70% of their time dealing with local um, governmental issues that, uh, instead of dealing with issues that deal with the state as a whole. And that's why we have had 947 constitutional amendments and it keeps going up. It is just absolutely ludicrous. A very um, cumbersome way to run a state. Yeah. Can I jump in here? Yeah. On that as well. I, I actually was in Montgomery last week. Uh, last week was the first time I was in Montgomery um, since March the 12th. But I was there to talk about an amendment that I actually have on the ballot. 
And I called legislative reference service. Those are our lawyers um, in the legislature to get the exact number um, of the amendments before I went on television. And they said, Representative Coleman, we gotta call you back. We gotta get the number. That's just how many amendments that there, there are to the state constitution, which is, which is ludicrous. That 1901 constitution was designed to centralize power in Montgomery. They wanted those folks at the time, remember all white men, landowners, rich people, they wanted to centralize that power. So when I'm talking to students and I'm giving speeches to people, I represent seven cities, um, only one county. Some of my colleagues represent various counties, but also four different school boards. I say, you're looking at a very powerful woman. And you know, people smirk about it when I say it. And then I explain to them how all of those entities, Nancy, even including the municipalities, have to come to us when they want to make major changes. I live in the city of Pleasant Grove. And um, we, we wanted to do something different with how we do our local elections. That is a legislative function, unless it was taken all the way through the, the federal courts, which ultimately end up happening. Um, but that's a legislative function. I have seen legislators, um, we do redistricting and um, we decide how those lines are gonna be drawn, not just for us, but for the county commissioners, and also um, um, for the for Congress, where people are looking at where people's houses are. That's how powerful we are. I get a chance to de design how my district looks or, or, or draw out who I don't want in the district. That 1901 constitution was designed in that manner to centralize power. And it makes no sense that Randall Whitman, who is the mayor of the city of Birmingham, um, or the city council that wants to raise their um, um, their their um, their occupational living wage. I couldn't, I couldn't even get it there. Not even the occupational tax. That's a, that was a whole nother issue. But they wanted to raise their minimum wage to a living wage, um, which they passed a local ordinance to do that. The Alabama legislature came back and passed a, 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 a bill to say that local municipalities do not have the ability to raise their own minimum wage. And so it was designed on purpose. And that's why I love uh, being able to work with Nancy for all of these years and educating folks now that we've got to change that because really the power should be closer to where the people are. And that's at the local level. Thank you. And can you speak to some of the, the remnants of 1901 that are in the present constitution. I know there are some initiatives on, on the ballot next week, yeah. kind of correct some of these things. Could you speak to some of those? Right. You, you stop me talking if I start talking too long on this particular issue. Um, I'm glad that we had a little bit of a, a time period um, from after we watched the film to when we started talking. Because although I've seen that film many times, when it was over, I was feeling some kind of way. Um, I was filled with so much emotion about how Black people um, and poor people and women um, and other uh, communities of color were disenfranchised by that, that document. But that how now today that I have an amendment on the state, on the, state uh, on the ballot this time, Amendment 4, to remove a lot of that racist language that they were talking about, you know, and the, the, the black and white children not being able to go to school together, you know, no interracial marriage, those kinds of things, trying to remove that, to move our document itself into a 21st century document. And I'm getting pushback. In 2020, I'm hearing of organizations, and now even some of my Republican colleagues, and you all didn't say I couldn't be partisan, but that some of my Republican colleagues now are going to are fighting me and, and although they voted for it but they're telling their constituents not to support it and when I when I again when I listened to that language it pulled up all kind of emotion in me and I'm thinking that in 2020 my colleagues that shake my hand give me a hug ask me about my children you're doing a great job and act as if they respect me to my face would go behind my back and vote against a measure that would actually uplift not only just people who look like me, who look like us and other communities of color, but, up, but that uplifts the entire state and the perception of who we are 
as a state, because we do have a sordid past. But this amendment to me, at least is a step in the right direction to the rest of the country and the rest of the world that we are not the Alabama of 1901, that we are the Alabama of 2020. So we'll see what happens if it passed or not. Y'all let me talk and talk. But I, I, I was, I had, I was, I'm telling you, I was feeling some kind of way after watching that. Uh, it put, it, it really pulled an emotion that I didn't even realize I was going to have. I, it really brought me to tears to know that we are still fighting this fight today. Okay, I'm done. No, no, that, that's, that, was, that was great. And it really speaks to the great job. And I have to say this, you know, just from a film perspective, that Melanie did. Yes. Uh, that film. Uh, the acting, you know, the, um, the, the blocking with the camera, everything. That was really, really impactful. And so yeah. we appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I, I did want to um, ask, because I'm starting to learn more about government. I participate in the response uh, to COVID-19 in my county. And I'm learning that, you know, even when my, um, even if we want to put something on the ballot for Macon County, that it may be somebody from Birmingham voting on whether or not what we do in Macon County, you know, is going to, is going to make it through, you know. Um, I want to ask Elise Tober. You know, why are voting rights so important? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. I think this entire conversation has really underscored the importance of voting. Voting, even in the video, is an act of self-preservation. It's an opportunity to have your voices and your choices made and known and heard. And even the authors of our constitution understood how powerful it was for each and every individual to vote. They, they didn't attack voting because they thought it was a willy nilly act, but because they knew that by empowering all people to have a say in how we construct our laws and our representatives, that it could drastically change the character of our state and ultimately the character of our nation. And so, um, you know, in modern day era, we've seen a number of efforts continuously to undermine the ability to vote, both in our voting methods, as we've definitely seen this year, um, the number of attacks on mail-in voting and alternative forms of voting in the midst of a global health pandemic in which over 200,000 people have died from a virus that spreads through the air. Um, we've seen that there have been attacks on voting from redistricting and gerrymandering. We've seen that there have been attacks on voting by um, pu putting out misinformation and disinformation. We've seen that there have been attacks on voting by, um, by uh, disenfranchising people because of their status to vote. Um, for instance, you know, disenfranchising formerly incarcerated people to vote. And we've also seen that there has been so much, a lot of efforts to to disengage people from the process of voting, to make them feel that voting um, is not an empowering act. And um, I think that that has been a representative, particularly among my generation, in which we don't see our issues represented in the full uh, scope of the political discourse and also in the issues and priorities of a number of our leaders. Um, and so I would say that voting rights are so important because voting is an important act. If everyone were to vote, our leaders and our issues would reflect our public opinion. And as of now, we have a vast and diverse and even progressive public opinion, but we don't have vast, diverse political will. And that's, there, that's where, the, dis, that's where the, the gap is. So, Voting is very important. It's one way that we can make our voice known. I vote on what I want for dinner with my family. Sometimes I win, sometimes I don't. I lobby for what I want, and um, sometimes it works. Um, but that's a part of the process, and it, it, it matters. It really does matter. Yeah, I, I, at least you give me hope. I'm going to tell you, I got, you are amazing. Um, but just so the people um, that are listening will know the legislative makeup, I should have said this when you 
talk about making the changes that you just mentioned, the legislature is 140 members um, um, in our state, uh, 35 senators, um, 105 House members. Of those 140 members, there are only 35 African Americans. Of those 140 members, there's only 37 um, Democrats in the House and eight in the Senate. We only have two white Democrats left in the full legislature. And of the 140 members, there are only 21 women. So when, those, when you talk about the issues specifically around family and a woman's right to choose and all kinds of other issues, you know, 21 women. We have uh, across the country, we have, we're one of the lowest in the country as it relates to the number of women serving in the legislative body versus other places. So I, I wanted to give perspective when we're talking about actually making social change, we have to put people in office that share our values so we can make that change. Thank you. Um, I want, we have two questions in the queue, but I, I have to acknowledge uh, the hand, the raised hand of one of our gold star mothers, Miss Roberta Crenshaw. Hey, Miss Crenshaw, it's so great to see you. Hey, Scott <laughs> and everyone. <laughs> hey, Miss Roberta. Hello. Hey. I was listening to our young representative and it, I am so upset because when I was 19, I was working for Martin Luther King as one of his, I guess we were warriors. And for me to be 72 and see that we are being pushed back, it breaks my heart. We've got to do something. Yes, yes. I, you know, it's just heartbreaking that blood, sweat, and tears, and all we went through fighting and marching and cooking and selling dinners and all, and in four years, we can be pushed back almost 300 years. It's so sad. And for the young lady, I've been where you are, where people will work with you face to face, and before you can get out of the building, they're trying to cut what you have done. But please don't stop trying. Please keep trying because a door will open and we're depending on you because you're a front runner. Thank you for that. I don't feel no ways tired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Roberta. <laughs> okay. Now we got two questions in the queue then. I saw a hand from it looks like James Jones, James 41X Jones, okay. So I got you third, sir. Uh, we're going to start with Sister Zatima, who says the Jim Crow laws, which the U.S. states implemented, which U.S. states implemented them, and which states initiated these laws. That's an open question for any one of our panelists. You're, You're on mute, mute Melanie. Oh, Senator Coleman's on mute too. Uh, yeah, I didn't, Marika probably wouldn't maybe know the. I'm sorry, that's history. what I meant. Um, um, that's okay. I, I I know they 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 came out of the South. There were a lot of uh, uh, lawsuits after Reconstruction in Mississippi, Louisiana, um, Alabama, um, and you know, not to get too deep into the history, but the you know after Reconstruction, there were a lot of. Um, lost representatives in the US House because of the way the South was behaving. And so they had to try to find a way to negotiate their way back in to have representation. And so it was just a battle between getting in, you know, having power, federal power, but also not lose your state's rights. Uh, so they just uh, found ways in the South to sort of basically keep doing what they were accustomed to doing, um, you know, uh, uh, famously, uh, you know, arresting a young black man for loitering or not having their papers or whatever, and then they're in jail and then they don't have the money to pay for help or their court fees. And so they have to, then someone says, well, I'll, t I'll pay your fees, but you can come work for me while you, and all of a sudden they're just basically re-enslaved. So it's, uh, they just, again, found ways to, uh, to circumvent um, the U.S. amendments, 13, 14, and 15, um, and 
you know, slowly some of those laws were adapted uh, up north and, and across the country. We certainly did not own racism and segregation, but we, we definitely initiated it. Um, and, and, and the only thing I, I would add, um, um, Melanie, um, black codes, then Jim Crow laws, and today we are still, you know, we, we still deal with the effects of it. As you were talking, I was thinking about some of the debates that we've had um, in the Alabama legislature, and I sponsored a racial profiling bill um, or, or an anti-racial profiling, uh, um, however you want to categorize it. And I remember some of the debate that we were having um, and um, my bill didn't, didn't pass, but we had colleagues that stood in front of me looking at the black woman who just told stories about how her brother, um, son, father uh, uh, have been racial profiled, issues that I've dealt with that literally said that does not happen. One of the cops, um, we have quite a few law enforcement officers in the legislature said to me, you know, one of the things that I think that will really help is if we got rid of some of the qualifying laws, I'm used, that's my term, that actually give law enforcement the ability to pull you over. The things such as we can't, the no light on your tag, or even the busted tail light, different things that gave them, give them probable cause to pull us over in the first place. Those are residual effects of Jim Crow laws. When we were talking earlier, even about poll taxes, I was in a conversation the other day when we talked about people trying to get their ballots in. And, and, and one of my colleagues at Miles told me he paid $27 to, to ship his, his ballot in express because he wanted to make sure that's a poll tax. Mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't have $27. Um, a lot of people may not be able to get off work for an entire day to go. So there are still residual effects of Jim Crow. I don't want us to get you know, just kind of stuck on where we were. Mm -hmm. I want us to also look at how those, those things still impacts us today and why Elise Talbert and young people are having a march in the streets. And Ms. Crenshaw just talked about the same issues that she was fighting for, our young people in the streets are, are fighting for right now. Mm -hmm. So again, I'll, this will always be my theme. We have to elect people who share our value system so we can change the policies that actually end up continue to enslave a people and people and disenfranchise people today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, on that note, I, I think that there was also a lot of pushback with having to get your uh, absentee ballot notarized, which is a cost uh, that some people didn't have. The, you know, I know right now in Alabama, we're dealing with the fact that they uh, allowed and then didn't allow and then allowed people who are worried about COVID to uh, submit their ballot with a waiver saying they didn't need a second signature. And of course, two weeks later, the Supreme Court overruled that. So now you've got several people who submitted a ballot in that two week window who do not know yet if their vote's gonna count, if they should cure it or invalidate it, vote, do, you know, provisional ballot. There's creating this, this chaos and confusion, the uh, no curbside voting in Alabama. Again, another Supreme Court decision that means if you are handicapped or worried that you are very susceptible to COVID, you, you have to, and now you might not be able to get it mailed in, so you gotta go risk your life to vote. Um, so, and you're seeing it across the country right now. The number that I heard on those uh, ballots that need to be cured, and I hope it's not right. The number I heard was 3,000. 3,000 people who could ultimately be disenfranchised because, it, and, and that happened at a clerk level now, mm -hmm. where somebody decided to go ahead and do the, the send the, the notices out for the waiver. I live in the Bessemer division, and my clerk decided not to do that because she specifically said, um, this has not finished the appeal process. I don't want my, you know, I don't want anything to negatively impact my folks. So she didn't send that waiver out. But we had that happen in the Birmingham division. The number I heard was 3,000. Yeah. I hope that's not right. I hope that's not right. Too. And I want to respond to the question about the states that began the implementation of these laws. It was all the southern states, they all adopted these type of constitutions like Alabama did. And I just want to read a quote from the Mississippi Constitution, uh, which they revised to pursue a policy of, this is verbatim, of crushing out the manhood of Negro citizens. Mm. 
that's what's in their constitution. So this was across the board in the southern states. And, and that statement <clears throat> was not just a social statement. It was a scientific one. That's what has to be understood. When you go into areas and you see young black men and you wonder what is wrong with them, there was a scientific systematic assault on the mind, on the spirit, on the bodies. I'm saying biochemical assaults through the drug program that was flooded through crack, through heroin, through the tainted marijuana, through the ghettos. And when you look at these young black men and you are wondering what the hell is wrong with them, that is what is wrong with us. And I want to point out another thing, and thank you, Satima, for your question yeah. and the um, conversation, the dialogue that you sparked with me. Um, what we're discovering as we work with this COVID problem, we go door to door. Uh, we started back in June, and what we first discovered was a debilitating mental health crisis. Mm. We discovered that. And we see it's growing. And a lot of times when we think about mental health, you always think about somebody else. You never think, hey, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm a little off, right? But, <laughs> but um, I want to cite four things, four things that, that, that we would describe as an intense darkness over the land. Mm. That is confusion that is being not just a natural confusion, it's being purposely and deliberately fomented. It's being cultivated a very intense confusion through disinformation. All of the sources that you normally trust to give you information are at best suspect, right? We, 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 we could not send on Facebook, we could not boost our uh, festival profile because Melanie chose a controversial topic <laughs> to make her <laughs> film about, and it might offend somebody. So we couldn't boost the post. They were asking for all kind of weird information, so we just said, "Forget it." We, you know, so we just had to try to push it person, you know, person by person. So until this election, you know, cycle is done. But of course, if they set the precedent in the election cycle, why would they give that power up, right? So you have a confusion. You have a very profound grief. Yes. So many people, yes, ma'am. So many people have so many losses. And not just the COVID. Uh, we were in Birmingham the other day for the memorial of um, Camille Cupcake McKinney. I could not even make the drive home, man. The stuff was so heavy. We had to pull over. Erica had to drive home. You know, so there's a, a confusion of a grief. There's anxiety that is crippling. You don't know if you're going to get the virus. Did you touch the mail? Oh, my God. Did, you know, did I rub my eye today? You know, all this kind of stuff. The anxiety around the election, right? Um, so you have all of these things kind of converging, grief, anxiety, confusion, loss, you know? And, it, and I don't think that uh, the, the people, let me just say, the, the power brokers who are pulling strings and playing games, I don't think they realize that they push things to a breaking point. You know, so I'm just going to encourage everybody to really protect yourself, you know, this election cycle. And it, and this is from William to everyone. If the Jim Crow laws are abolished, will it cause a judicial shift? And why is the state and federal government willing to keep it on the books? That's for anyone. I'll speak to that because one of the things that I, I have been pondering is about I saw the film last night for the first time and watching it again, I'm like you, uh, Ms. Coleman, it was, it was hard to watch. Um, but I am struck by the absolute intentionality 
yes. of the people who drafted that document. They were extremely intentional. And as a country, we have, they have been extremely intentional. I, I know a lot of you have seen the documentary 13th that's based on the 13th Amendment. How is it that they were so intentional that they put that loophole in there that would lead 100 plus years later to mass incarceration? You know, there are all of these really diabolical intentionalities that are abounding. But I think, you know, to, to, to shift to a, a kind of a metaphysical look at where we are on a planetary level right now, you know, I, 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 I kind of um, look at the birthing process, you know, when a, that's not a, a, a really pretty process. It's, it's, it's painful, it's messy, it's but It's a necessary part of getting the baby here. And we are in a planetary shift, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. We are in the midst of the dying of all of these systems that have been so oppressive for thousands of years. You know, we are watching the, uh, the dismantling of patriarchy. You know, we are watching the dismantling of white supremacy. And it doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good right now. But I just want to say that no matter how intentional they are about what they're doing, that there is another order yes. at work in the universe. And just encourage us to stay encouraged. Yeah. Yes, yes. And we had a question from Brother James. And if you can unmute yourself. I'm trying. Uh, greetings, peace, and blessings to everyone. Peace. Oh, more like a statement, if I may. First to Sister Marika, uh, thank you for your heroic efforts in going to the front line of our political machines. I thank you for the love showing your emotions towards the care to ratify and change a lot of the injustice that have been transferred into written language and documents and statutes against us. Think it not strange that people you are talking to, you're seeing behind their facade. Uh, don't let your awakening to what they really are doing stifle you. Uh, think it a sign for you to really see the man behind the Wizard of Oz curtain yeah. that's pulling the strings and what your duties and responsibilities are in terms of that. When the human mind experiences tragedy and emotional overwhelming and problems faster than it can solve, it shut down. That typifies the state of our community. As a clinical thinker, as a doctor, as a healer, looking at the illnesses of racism and hate and disenfranchisement, you can get more to the direct cause of what these injuries and illnesses are that are in the nature of people, black and white, that have to be addressed. One thing comes to me is we have an enormous responsibility, but if we look at that, we first have to assess our ability to respond and see what that looked like so we can quantify what we are actually able to do to improve our ability to address and confront these dynamic forces that are against us, that have always been against us. And to Sister Norma, I just wanna say, you can't get more intentional than going to somebody's country and stealing their people and bringing them over here. <laughs> so if you don't see things in retrospect to that reality, then you, you are not seeing the picture the way it really is. The hope of the divine is within ourselves as we release the divine energy within ourselves okay. to respond, the ability to respond. Now, when we look at what has happened to disenfranch our generations and stigmatize them to where they're not able to relate to one another. So we look at the educational system that generational learning from the elders to the child have been impeded. So there's no discussion going on that allow us to see issues and future events and present events in one group. That's our responsibility to do that. Uh, to Sister Marika, we can't have no more representation in local government or national or regional government than we have a 
organized conscious constituent base in the community that woke in effect. That's right. Basically, we must get in the community. We must heal our people. We must love our people. If they smoke weed, bad weed, get them good weed. Hell, I mean, I mean what? I mean, I mean, you know, they're gonna smoke it anyway. Okay, so let's get them some good weed. If that's the first, and then hopefully at the end of the good weed, they come to the notion of well, maybe I really shouldn't smoke weed at all. When it comes to important things, then maybe they don't. They say maybe I don't need to smoke weed. Period. I've had enough. I'm cool now. But an intimate relationship with our community to support and develop and nurture and heal and to police. Because when people cluster in groups, they're trying to solve problems, they're trying to think. Now remember, I want to repeat this. When you have emotional events that happen, as Scott was referencing, that occur faster than you can emotionally process that. Mm -hmm. Then what it suppresses resilience. Love and nurturing and prayer fosters a, a continuity, a, 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 a group of resilience. Resilience is the ability to you to respond in difficult situations by having a nurturing support group that could address where you're deficient at, where you're hurt at, where you're broken at. What Scott is referring is people that don't have those groups around them of love and care and correct intelligence that can create a nurturing environment of support that one can be able to soldier through these difficulties that we have. We have in young people that have heart attacks at 35, 25, 45, and all of the health disparity and mental health issues. Uh, these are areas we really have to focus around and build a base. I just wanted to share some input in terms of what I think and what I feel. And uh, esoteric is good, Sister Norma, but it doesn't enact on its own. There's a compliance with a divine reality that we have to line up with and deal with the criminal inside of ourselves and then deal with the criminal in our community. They are very intelligent men that have a deliberate plan to do what they do. Okay, that's fine. But what is our attention? And what will we do for the next generation? And what legacy will we leave them to carry the good fight? So uh, the civil rights movement to uh, the mother, well, it slowed down to stop because the connection, the disconnect between the generations. Uh oh, somebody he, he got muted, but I can't. May I may I respond? I don't know if he muted himself. Um, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. I'm sorry, but there that's was, just I, all I wanted, I wanted to, to say. Yes, I wanted to thank, thank you. James. Appreciate that as yes. always. Yes, uh, I, and I really wanted. There was a the first part of what you were you were mentioning struck me so much because those of us that are in this movement that are doing the work and everybody on here, I know even the, the people that are, are listening, um, you are people that are part of the movement. Sometimes it's heavy, sometimes it's lonely. Um, and so I have learned to surround myself with people that when I feel that heavy burden and I'm a person of faith, cause you know, we in the South, you know how we are, I'm a person of faith. But I've also learned that I need to be able to purge so I'm in therapy to be able to do the work that we do. Um, you have to be able to get some of that off you so you can be the best you, the best you for other people. And yeah. as James was talking, you know, uh, I, I, it, I, it even made me think about my husband. Um, you know, in my bio, it told you that my, my husband passed away in February. Yes, ma'am. But my husband had, his, uh, he had his first stroke when he was 42 years old. He was working in the Congresswoman's office, Congresswoman Sewell's office, you know, running the halls of, right, you know, yeah. Congress and, you know, but, but because he, he, he's a, he had a servant's heart, you know, he took this stuff home. He took it to heart. And that's happens to a lot of us in the movement. We internalize it and it's impacting us. That's why it's so important what we put in our bodies and that we do also take care of ourselves. So I wanted to thank him for the acknowledgement there, because in order for Melanie Jeffcoat to continue to do the kind of work that she's done, and Melanie, I've been thinking about ways that we need to go on the road again and bring this back out so people can, you know, see, you know, especially young people, um, 
in order for you to be able to do that work um, and to be able to take care of your daughter as a mother, you have to take care of yourself. Yes. Um, Amen. And, and everybody, that, that's the thing. And, I, and I, when James starts talking, I just, I've been trying to do that more because as an elected official for many years, I will tell you the one positive of the Trump presidency to me is that if a man who has, I don't know how many baby mamas and how many wives and all of that can be president and he can be elected that way for just being himself with all of the flaws, it got me into being myself. Cause yeah. there used to be an aura that you had to have to be an elected official, Nancy. You remember, and even my colleagues have told me that I've calmed down some. <laughs> I, you know, uh, there was a way that you had to be, there was a way that you had to dress. You weren't able to tell people that you had been married and divorced or all of that stuff that you had to keep inside. So if there's one positive for me personally, I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about the film festival, this is me. It's that if he can be that open and people still vote for him, <laughs> I can be my true self. <laughs> that has been helpful for me to be able to tell, tell my truth. Um, but y'all, but in this work, we got to take care of ourselves so we can be the best us to continue to fight the good fight. Yeah, Didn't know yeah. I was going to talk about that when we were talking about the 1901 Constitution. Well, <laughs> you know, it's just like when you're on an airplane and you're flying with a child and the flight attendant will look at you as a parent and say, if there's a problem, put the mask on yourself first and then take care of your child, even though every parent knows your instinct is to take care of the child first. But the reality is, if you can't breathe, you're both going to die. So take care of yourself and then your child. And that's kind of, I, I think of that a lot as I go through, because you need to decompress and step away from some of the, when Nancy gave me those transcripts, and I spent a good couple of months reading them, and it was just sickening um, to read those words. Um, I wanted to segue, and I know there's more questions because I know we've talked a lot about voting rights, which is a big passion for me. Um, but I did want to make sure that, that people understand that today, uh, they're still impacted by that constitution, uh, in the way we educate people in Alabama. Um, and I know I've talked a lot tonight. Um, this is not just an Alabama problem. Generally speaking, people have forgot how to be critical thinkers. Um, but in Alabama, uh, you know, they they did not want what they called, pardon my language, but Negro rule, which is basically local rule. Um, they did not want any person of color to have power. Um, the way to maintain that was to guarantee that black people and poor people did were not educated at the same level as the the white counterpoints, even in the same city. Um, and even after, you know, Brown v. Board of Education, when you, you know, and, and the end of segregation, you still see, and this is, and Nancy can speak, and probably Marika specifically about uh, the Constitution, but the way we um, fund our schools here uh, is directly tied to that Constitution. And it is why Mountain Brook and a uh, high school and a high school in Selma will basically get the same federal allotment, uh, I mean, state allotment, but they're, you know, Mountain Brook has parents literally dumping bags of money in the door. And, and the, I visited schools in the Black Belt where the principal's washing laundry uh, for some of their students and all teachers are buying their own supplies. So that is all, talk about intentionality um, that is a hundred year old tradition that was established in 1901 that to this day is guaranteeing that your education is based entirely on your zip code. Um, and so I talked too long, but I wanted to defer to Nancy and, and Marika to break it down. So voters understand that this, that's why it's so important for us to change this constitution. Fundamentally, it is still impacting our students today. I want to defer to the constitutional scholar here on <laughs> to Nancy as it relates to that 1901. She's able to articulate it so yeah. easily. Yeah, well, it's so true that unfortunately, as, as Melanie has said, um, a, a student in Wilcox County, probably uh, the local community together with the state funding and the federal funding, maybe spent we spend $7,000 per 
child per year, whereas in Mountain Brook it's probably 13 or 14,000. So it's such inequality. When I first came here 27 years ago, the first thing I said in a meeting was, why haven't we equalized education? And people said, who are you and where have you come from? <laughs> that, you know, that's such a that's such a bizarre thought here. And yet in Europe, all of the kids who are educated in Germany, Sweden, Norway, all receive the same amount of money. Why do we do this to children? Why do we make um, them suffer because they don't? And, and why, are the, why are the teachers providing toilet paper and, and, and paper and pencils to the children in some schools and the other case, the PTA is providing that for other teachers. It's, it's very unfair as so much. And as, as Marika brought up, it was so disgusting that when uh, Birmingham raised the minimum to $10 and 10 cents, the state stepped in and said, oh no, you can't do that. And the leader of that legislation that brought that about was making $400 an hour as a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, not all lawyers make that much money, I know, but anyway, but it is just so inappropriate, inappropriate, altogether inappropriate. And um, it just boggles the mind to think that we are still so uh, hurtful to so many of us and, uh, and why and why and what is the purpose of it all? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, that the amendment four that I have on the ballot this time failed a couple of times. And, um, and uh, but one of the times it failed was because there was language in it that talked about public education being a right. Yes, yes. And people came out of the woodworks fighting that amendment because there were in the education article, it said public education is a right. You would think in um, a world power, in, the, in, in, in a first world country, which we are, we're not a third world country, we're a first world country, that, you, that educate, public education would be a right. That all children would have the right to go and be adequately educated. But there are people in the state of Alabama that do not want that language and didn't want it, and they were successful in defeating the, the amendment because of that. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. And, this, it, and that that language that said basically it is not a right because no activist judge can take these words and allow them to constitute a right to education. Those words are part of Amendment 111 that was established right after Brown versus Board of Education in Alabama to override Brown versus Board of Education. There is... Uh, a inherent negativism towards helping people rise. I just, it is, it is profoundly disgusting. I got the, the statement that comes to my mind as I'm listening to you all, and as a career educator, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, this is a topic that's very dear to me. Um, I look at what's happening in Montgomery with the legislation right now to get the taxes increased to help the public school system. And you have a group of folks from Auburn, one of the more wealthy yes. school systems yes. in the state, who have decided that they are going to influence the vote in Montgomery for the children of Montgomery who are, and most of the school children in Montgomery are predominantly African-Americans because of the segregationist academies that were established um, and still going to schools with names like Jeff Davis and, and, and Robert E. Lee. Um, it is absolutely amazing, but I, I, I just offer us a quote by Neely Fuller. I use it often, it's he who says that until you understand racism, everything you think you know will only confuse you. So, don't be dismayed that you're confused. You're confused. I, I want to mention one quick thing here, and that is that this is a great discussion and sharing of ideas, plus Melanie's film, which is heroic. When this film first came out, many of us in Alabama Citizens for Constitutional Re uh, Reform sent it to every single history teacher in high school in Alabama. Now, as she said, maybe it was used, maybe it wasn't used, but 
Now, I hope you will send this particular evening's discussion on uh, electronic media to those history. They are now all, hopefully, I would assume, as we have just heard, um, teachers are looking for things because they're teaching online and it would be a great, great benefit if they could have this to show their students, we need the history of Alabama, the, the, particularly the history of um, the black effort throughout this state. And, and, I don't show, and our children don't know that history and they need to, and that would be- Yeah, they, they teach in Alabama, well, at least, and, and Miss Norma, you might know better, but for my girls, it was fourth grade. Uh, they, they talk about the 1901 constitution, which is just absurd because it's a- it's not the book. There you go. This, there is, you my go. Fourth, this is my fourth grade. I just want to know yeah. Alabama, and I pulled it out because I knew this would come up in the discussion. Yeah, we have and have my, both of my daughters, they went to public school and they brought home the little sheet and it was like, it, the 1901 constitution, blank, disenfranchised. And I'd ask my kids, and one of my kids was in fourth grade when I was making Open Secret. And I was like, what does that mean? I don't know. Well, what do you think happened? I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's another deliberate attempt to say we taught it, but we taught it at an age where it just went in one ear and out the other. And then it, I, I tried to get this film screened. Like I said, we got a, a humanities grant to get it in every library in high school. I had one teacher who uh, said, I'd like to screen it. And I went and spoke at that school. Um, the other teacher at that school said it was too hot. <laughs> It was, it was too, too hot to discuss. And it made me think, you know, recently, and I know it's a political uh, minefield right now, but, and I really am trying to stay off of social media because it just is making me crazy. But someone I know uh, posted a quote from the Access Hollywood tape uh where trump said something very offensive and he put the words that trump said in his facebook post and all of these people were like that is so offensive you need to take this down how dare all these people who supported trump but saw that thought it was offensive for their friend to post the words and i thought okay so they know something's wrong with it but the the connection between that it came from the person that they put yeah. yeah and it was that same sort of thing like that that subject is too hot because it's got the n-word in it or it's got you know language that's going to offend people and i thought well then that's a, all the more reason why we need to be talking about it and talking about it with kids who are old enough to have in high school real discussions about the disparities before they register to vote and become voting members of society um, because I have two kids who um, everything they know about the Alabama Constitution is because I am their mom right mm -hmm. not because anything they remembered from their one fourth grade class now I have one daughter who had a great U.S. history teacher um, and she actually because it was here in Alabama she you know she knows all about the constitution and its problems. So she did an extra, it was, my kid was just lucky. She got a teacher that wanted to talk about it. Um, so it's, um, we're so worried about offending people, but not worried about how offensive the document is to so many of our people, if that makes sense. It, it does make <laughs> sense. It's the foundation of it. Yes. Right. I'm reminded of the Ethiopian proverb that says, until the lion learns to write, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And I just want to read a couple of things from my fourth grade Alabama history book. One is on plantation life. And the first word in this chapter is, now we come to one of the happiest ways of life in <laughs> Alabama before the war between the states. Oh, yeah. And it goes on, it goes on. And remember, I'm 66 years old, so it's been a long time since I was in fourth grade, but the impact of this, and great, luckily I was in a school that was all black and I had a compassionate teacher. 
who oh. hold shared things with us that we need here as young African American fourth graders. And then way over in the next chapter, I'm just gonna read one other thing about the Ku Klux Klan. And it states, the loyal white men of Alabama saw that they could not depend on the laws or the state government to protect their families. They knew that they had to do something to bring back law and order. Now this is the text oh, wow. that every child in the state of Alabama in that year read. This is, this is, you know, so taking, having, having our children educated properly is different from having our children just educated. So miseducation of the Negro as Carter D. Woodson framed it, yeah. is something that we have to look really critically at. You know, yeah. we can't just send our children to school and think that they're being educated. Most times they're being miseducated. That's and right. now that the truth that's been crushed to earth so long is rising again, this this backlash, you know, even the president is talking about he's not going to fund schools that teach the 1619 project. Mm -hmm. You know, people are coming unglued because the truth is being told. Right. But that's the only weapon that our children are going to have to, to, you know, to live by is the truth. We have to unearth it. That's right. So thank well, you, Melanie, for yeah. helping in that effort. That's right. And, and I know I'm looking at the time, I know we're coming to the end. I just wanted to just mention one, uh, this one piece when it comes to how we're funded, um, how education is funded. Here, just an example. That fourth grade class is the one that always comes to Montgomery to the mm -hmm. legislature. That's the fourth grade trip for affluent schools. That's right. For affluent schools. We always see the affluent schools make it at the gallery, um, they get a chance to come and sit in the members' chairs. You know, I, they, I'm invited to, to some of the ones that are not in my district. And, I, you know, I, I'm encouraging them and talking to them about running for office one day. How do my schools make it to Montgomery? When I have some extra money, we do have a community service pot. Sometimes we'll get a lot, sometimes we'll get a little bit where I can give that money to the schools to actually bring them to Montgomery. Something is wrong with that. Because th those affluent children get a chance to see their government in action. They get a chance to touch, feel, listen, and actually, and you know, when you, when you can actually see something touch, feel, you can imagine that you can do it one day. And it's just unfair that our low income, the, the low income areas are in our schools that don't have as much money. They don't have that property tax revenue um, or their parents don't have enough money to supplement the field trip. Um, they don't get that same experience. Um, and so if we're, if we're talking about that fourth grade history book that you read, um, even if you read some of that and you got a chance to come and meet some people and you see something different, you've had that experience. A lot of our kids don't get that experience. And we do have to do something about that. And I just want to give kudos to her. Malika wasn't able to join us, but oh, her yeah. father, Hank Sanders, yeah. every year, 21st century youth, had to go to the state house and sit in those chairs and seats of power and have a mock legislative session. So I just want to give kudos to your former yeah. colleague, Senator Hank of Mark Sanders. Yeah. Hey, he, he's my all way colleague. There will never be another one like him. Absolutely. And I, I do, uh, we have one more hand up, uh, Ms. Roberta Beavers. That's hi. our Berwick friend. I wanted to say hi to Roberta Crenshaw too. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, in Maine, uh, all fourth graders, all, all schools come, as far as I know. I mean, it, I when I was in the legislature, I that was one of the things I looked forward to most. <laughs> That because so I, I, I w lived in Augusta during the week and it was, you know, a tie to home. <laughs> and uh, and they, they also got to go to our state museum, which is a four-story building that's on the same campus as, as our uh, state capitol. And uh, so I, I totally agree with you, all, all students should have that opportunity. It might be a little young fourth grade be, for them to really absorb it, but um, I'm glad that they do it. Yeah. And we have um, 
Another hand, Mr. Timothy Muhammad, Richmond, Virginia. Then I'm going to ask one or two last questions okay. after this. I, I just wanted to uh, say that this, the, the film was eye-opening for me. Uh, not that I didn't know there was systemic racism, but um, and I was just thinking about the fact that you were talking about young students in school yeah. and how they look at test scores of young students and they can project uh, based on what they're teaching, <laughs> uh, how many of them approximately will end up in prison. And, and with that, you know, it's, 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 it's really disheartening that many black men uh, were targeted in so many ways, but you know, you commit a crime and then you're not allowed to vote. Right. You know, so that's, you know, and, I, and it just seemed like a lot of talk about it, but it's not really much being done to, uh, for these men who have paid their debts to society and then they come out and they don't even have a voice in their own community. So I just want to know if, you know, I know uh, Sister Norma had actually spoke about the industrial, prison industrial complex, but it's, 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 it's very disheartening. And what I don't know what's really being done to even ratify that. Timothy, are you from here? Are you from Alabama? No, I'm not. Okay. That I'm, I need, I, I need I to ask, right, I needed to ask that question um, because actually in our legislature, um, we did pass a voter reenfranchising um, act. Now, I, I think it ought to be automatic reenfranchisement. Um, right. You know, you paid your debt to society. Um, you, you know, and and actually, you should never actually lose your right to vote. That goes back to those original, those those original um, means of disenfranchising of people. Yeah. Um, but here, we did pass something called a moral turpitude bill. Um, and it just, um, any bill that was not deemed moral of moral turpitude, you could apply to get your rights back to vote. So there are many organizations now that are, and, and a lot of lawyers that have been trying to work with folks to re-enfranchise them. Um, but, the, the, but the portion that um, we still have to work on is you have to have paid your, you have to have paid your fees as well. That's the portion oftentimes that keeps people, if you got a $50,000 debt, that's gonna be, a, it's gonna take you a minute to get that, you know, to be able to be re-enfranchised. But we have done a little something in Alabama, um, but the only way we got it done, um, the Republicans wanted to do a voter um, ID bill um, some years ago. We, we did some voter ID stuff and we had to couple some things together in order to get what we want it done. Uh, I'm, I'm stumbling a little bit because it's so lengthy if I just had to tell the whole story about how we, we got it done. But there are some people, the ACLU in Alabama has a great website to tell people what is the process in order to get your, your voting rights back. Some people haven't even lost them. They just think they have. And um, that's a huge voting block right there. In Florida, that was a, you remember, that was a huge, that's, that was a, they had a huge, um, debate over that. They did a referendum and then the legislature came back and took it to pull that right back from folks having the automatic ability to be able to get their voting rights back. But it goes back to the conversation that we've been having from the beginning about if voting was not so important, there wouldn't be all of these impediments to being able to vote. But here at least, Tim, we thought we've done a little something. We've got more to do. And it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I know Ms. Crenshaw has her hand up, and we have two more questions. Um, before I go to Ms. Crenshaw, I just want to um, uh, speak to the question that uh, Timothy raised. And I thank you, sir, for that, 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 that very important question. We just um, passed the 25th anniversary of the Million Man March Holy Day of Atonement. And, you know, I was blessed to spend some time with the Reverend James Luther Bevel, who was the architect of the voting rights movement. And he shared with me, because a lot of people uh, heard Minister Farrakhan say that Reverend Bevel was an angel that brought the idea of atonement to the Million Man March. And I asked Reverend Bevel about that. And he said that how it came about was he was dealing with the issue 
of black men losing their right to vote when they go to prison. But he saw Lyndon LaRouche running for president from prison. Lyndon LaRouche was sitting in the prison cell running for president of the United States. So he went to see him. And when he went to see him, in the ensuing conversation, he discovered, you know, that when Mr. LaRouche started running for president, he got access to classified information. They found out about an impending assassination attempt on Minister Farrakhan. And that prompted a visit from Reverend Bevel, and the rest is is is, is pretty much history. So I just wanted to, to speak to that. Um, it's very interesting. Um, and I thank you, Ms. Uh, Representative Coleman for pointing out that that is just a vestige, you and, uh, and, and Melanie. Um, we're gonna move to our gold star mom again, Ms. Roberta Crenshaw. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, I wanna speak on the prison issue because you know, I worked 25 years in the Department of Corrections in Alabama. And part of my pre-release program was trying to convince the inmates when they get out to try and do the paperwork and stuff to get their right to vote. That was the hardest job. They didn't trust the government. They didn't believe it was gonna happen. I mean, as much as I talked to them and gave them the paperwork about them, they just didn't wanna have nothing to do with it because it was a trust issue and which is so sad because if they do that paperwork, I tell them, don't come in class complaining about the government when you can get out there, get your rights back and vote. So I hope somebody in the Department of Corrections and Reentry is doing the same thing that I did to encourage the inmates to get their rights back to vote. I told them if they can go out there and buy some marijuana, they can save money to pay to get their rights back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ms. Crenshaw, as usual insightful and impactful. Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask the last two questions. The first one, um, I'm hoping Sister Elise is still with us. I would like to get her response. Uh, and then anyone else who wants to chime in, is there, are there any lessons from our Alabama voting rights history that apply today that you would like to share? And anyone else in of our panelists can answer that as well. I, I have a thought on that, and it, it comes from watching um, Sanjay Gupta on CNN talking about the COVID, and he said, I wonder if we could see the COVID sprinkling, like if it was a color, the germs or whatever, if people would be more uh, careful and be wearing their masks. And I kind of, to Timothy's point, you know, voting is life or death for all of us, whether we see it or not. And I sometimes feel like if we could kind of like if we could see the COVID, if we could step back big picture and see the lines drawn between just me, you know, privileged white woman um, who may think I have nothing, but you carefully dig into the minutia, the devils in the details, we're all just a step or two away from, from losing some essential rights um, by ignoring um, the ability to go to, to the polls. Um, so I think that it, it's easy when you look at voting rights and lynchings and things that it was literally life or death. It is literally life or death for a lot of people, but it is for, for really for all of us. You look at how your parents or grandparents are treating in, nur in nursing homes. You look at like everything is connected to um, who we have elected to represent us. Um, and at some point you're gonna run into a wall and get really frustrated and it's gonna go back to uh, a vote that you maybe participated in or didn't. So it, 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 I really wish people would understand that it is so much more than just something to put on Instagram with your sticker. It's like, I'm, although I'm happy to see that. Um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because that's like seeing the COVID, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish people would see voting rights like, that important yeah but but there, there's there's what we're doing tonight of course is important um but there has to something and this is my opinion this is not scientific um uh, something has to happen at that elementary level um where there is real 
civic education mm -hmm. and where you understand that um, being a member of the polity um, is your inalienable right as a member of, you know, as a citizen in this country and don't give it away. That uh, the way the US constitution was designed, although it wasn't for all of us initially, the way the Declaration of Independence was written, um, um, it was the power is with the people, not the elected officials. And so many people have given their own power away. Um, I go in a room and people think I'm important. Um, well, it's the people who elected me that are really important. And we've lost that somewhere. So the educate, and, and, but that's real work, y'all. If it's not happening in the, in the, in the school system, an organization or someone that that has to happen so we then don't have to convince the 21 year old why he or she needs to vote mm -hmm. you know uh, so that has you got to do the work at the front end we got to do power analysis training so people can understand where when they actually do have a problem who they go to you need your streets paved you got a pothole in your street you don't call your state legislator you know which i get those calls you call your city council person Mm -hmm. Your social security check is missing. I got, got those calls. You don't call your state legislator. That's a congressional issue. So there's some education that has to happen at a level where we get people. So it's not boring. Like this, what we're doing, we're, we're, we're all wonks. We're all history nerds that are on here. But we got to get people excited and engaged at some level that we don't have to convince them later on. And I don't have the answer to that. I wish I did. If I had the answer to that, I would have a, you know, a show, write a book or something. <laughs> and, but, but those of us that are here, we, we have to continue to have these engaging conversations. Mm -hmm. And I, I do know at some point we will come up with that answer, but we, we, we gotta get people excited about being members of the polity. You know, I had a, a neighbor years ago that was really frustrated with something in our community. Um, and she was telling me all about it. And I was newer to town. I said, well, let's email the mayor. Like, this is a big thing with the city, a big problem. And uh, she said, you don't email the mayor. I said, he works for me. Yes, I do. Open the laptop. Ba -da 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 -da. Started communication. Starting this. This woman was like, you just emailed that was like, they they work for me. The president works for me. The state legislature works for me, you know, and and I realized the benefit I had to having very politically active parents um, that, that instilled that in me. But the average person, they do. And Marika, you are a powerful and wonderful, incredible woman. But you also listen to your constituents because you know that that your power is in taking their desires and creating, uh, you know, actually actualizing some results for them. Um, but the average people don't know that they have a voice, much more than just voting. Um, before we move on to the next question, we, we have one more question and then we have Brother James. Um, I want to thank you all. And we had several educators on the line, and we still have a few on the line right now. So we're going to get this out. Um, I do want to acknowledge, besides all of our friends that have joined us, another friend of our community. Um, we're joined tonight by our, um, our county uh, commissioner, uh, Mr. Miles Robinson. So we want to thank him for coming and listening to this discussion and witnessing it. And of course, if he wants to say anything, the floor is open. But he's one of these people who uh, is trying to work for this community. So we thank him for being on. Thank you. All right. Well, th thank you, Scott. Um, I have certainly enjoyed the engagement. I've been on for most of the uh, discussion. It has been very enlightening. Uh, thanks to all of you for doing this great work, uh, Representative Coleman. Uh, I remember you from our days down in the legislature and representing Tuskegee and providing some technical support and coming down there with our hands out. So you guys have been very gracious to our university. So thank you. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. Uh, I think we lost him. Yeah, we lost him. 
We're losing. Uh, okay. Are we still breaking? There you go. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing and the great work. And it's been very enlightening. I wish others could be, you know, uh, in a listening audience or participating in some way. So just again, thank you all for what you're doing. It's been a great evening. Thank you, sir. He has a great representative also in a representative Peblin Warren, who is uh, an alum, and she is not going to let Tuskegee not be taken care of. <laughs> exactly. 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 We share, uh, I just want to interject, and I, I, I couldn't help but during the discussion to reminisce. I'm originally from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, you know, names just started pouring out as you all were engaged, and, you know, from Megar Everett, the NAA field, uh, CP field secretary at the time. And I grew up one block from where he was slain, one block. Mm -hmm. And to have the community uh, just ascend or descend, if you lack of a better term, on that residence the night that that happened, that will be forever embedded in my soul. And so you just never know what influence, impact as a young youngster in that stuff just cares. Who knows? You know, um, I started thinking about the 1963 when Kennedy was killed in November. Matter of fact, it's etched in stone in my mind. November 22nd. I don't even have to think about it. 1963, my mother was carrying my youngest brother. <clears throat> In February, uh, she named my youngest brother after him. <laughs> so he's walking around with three last names. She named him after, <laughs> you know, she named him after Kennedy and Everest. Imagine three last names. But anyway, that's that's. I just thought I'd interject that little story. So we're we, you know, we, it it caused some reminiscing going on here this evening. <laughs> Well, that means it's effective. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. And to the panelists, my last question is, do we need a new constitutional convention? Yes. 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 <laughs> An unequivocal yes. Excellent. So um, that can be a discussion for another time. How do we make that happen? But let's make that happen. I just put the link in the chat. And uh, you know, if you have a follow-up email that you send out, um, that that film is available on YouTube. So I would, I know it's quarantine, so you can send it, email it, watch it with your family, have a discussion afterwards. If you know young people, have them watch it, have see what feedback you get. I also put a link to the ACCR website, the constitutionalreform.org, where not only can you read more about the Constitution, you can read more about how it's impacted you and how you can get involved in the push for creating a new constitution for a new century, which we desperately need. Yes. Well, we thank you all. Um, I want to open up uh, for James Jones to make the final statement of the evening. I'm sorry, James, 41 next. He's no longer Jones. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, when we look at the identity of the individual and we look at regional government, state government, city government, and national government, what we absent is is community. Your identity is tethered to your personal community, the people you live next door to. If the community you live in is unhealthy, then you are unhealthy. If the community that you live in is sick or drug written and gang written and unable to take care of itself, Government start in your household and outside the door in that direction. That's who you are. If you're lobbying for a base that has not been established, that's in chaos, you have to be rooted in that community and work from there to have an appropriate identity so you can understand the urgency of the problem and how to meet that. If you don't think outside the box, you're done. I watched the movie Shaka Zula years ago and they were concerned that they didn't have enough men to send to South Africa. But the English government said, we do have one thing that's tried and tested and that's double talk. So double talk is what they use to confound the people. Yeah. 
if we do not understand what family is, family is a living principle of relationship of the government of a husband and a wife and children and extended members. The extended members go outside the house. This relationship is, gives us our identity of who we are. How many of us are actually with the poor daily? How many of us are with the hungry and with the broken? When the last time somebody walked up to you and say, I killed somebody today, help me, I don't know what I'm doing. Or somebody killed my brother or my sister or this or that is going on. We have to maintain grassroots constituency and build from there so that we can see the problem at the ground level. But when we look at all of the games of deceit and lies and double talk, well, some of this just need to be just abolished because there's no reasoning in it. It's, it's a lie. It's a great big lie. And there's genuine government that is hid behind the line. That's what we need to aim for. But, but I'm hoping that we have a more grounded community relationship that you can't move the big forces on the national until you organize the small forces on the local and on the regional. That had one mind is what you have to achieve. And when people don't feel you care about them and don't love them and your pain is not their pain, and you can't talk to them. So please go to the grassroots, touch the people, share their joy and their pain, like Brother Scott and Sister Erica are doing, and those of you on the panel and in the community that I can't see that's on the call, continue to do these things because that's what that's what builds community base and that's what builds family. That's all. Thank you, sir. We um we want to thank all of you for uh, coming and, and sharing. Uh, your, your, your spirit and your energy uh, with our community this evening. Um, we are really um, looking to energize the Selma Bridge Crossing Jubilee this year with things of substance um, because we, we need substance. Uh, we need energy. We need healing um, yes. across the board. Um, we will not we do not plan to exhibit another film in November. Um, however, December, we intend to show a film. And, you know, Eric and I, we, 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 we haggle. And I keep telling her that I get two votes because I'm, you know, me. Uh, but we're taking on more members. <laughs> we're taking on more members to sit in our committee and decide our next uh, films. Um, we've had some very powerful films, like My Alpha 21 is a film that kind of reminds me of Open Secret, um, because in order to actually have a grasp on what's going on now, you need to know the context that the goings-on are goings-on in. And, you know, we're having conversations in the Black community about a woman's right to choose but if you don't understand what Margaret Sanger was doing, and now the <coughs> womb of a black woman is the most dangerous place for black lives in America, you know, you have to see that film. And we want to show it. Um, we also, in light of many of the things that were going on, uh, Brother Robinson spoke to Medgar Evers. Uh, we've been, we have a series called the Post-Traumatic Assassination Syndrome, where we examine how assassinations have affected the uh, generations that come after the assassinations. And so we're trying to make space, you know, and uh, normally at our film festival, we go 10 to 13 hours a day <laughs> in the theater, man. People bring blankets and pillows, and I mean, we go at it, but this year, we have to split time with the other um, events in our festival. So we have to be painfully selective in what we're doing and we have to kind of do what Melanie did with her film and squeeze <laughs> you know, all of this information into you know, something point, poignant and something um, uh, uh, with clarity and something that makes sense. So we're working really hard on that. 
but we want you to keep your uh, eyes open for our December presentation. We intend to have a January presentation. Uh, we've been planning on um, releasing some of Reverend Bevel's book, um, which you have to. You ha the man spoke in formulas. He spoke in science formulas. And a lot, his conversation is missing. And so we want to present that. We have a few uh, film contexts to present that in. So we have our, our hands full. So I don't want to you know, keep you any longer. I just wanted you to know that you should come to our next uh, exhibition and bring your hearts and minds with you so you can make another contribution. Melanie, we're going to be contacting you because I'm sure our Virginia chapter and our um, Massachusetts chapter will probably want to do something like this in their community. And we want to assemble you all again to, uh, to make some statements. And, and we just thank you. And can we ask uh, Brother James to close us out with a prayer? I'll be honest, sir. Uh, Heavenly Father, we ask all those that are on the line who care about our plight and our concern that you would bless them and cover them and give them the spirit to keep seeking you to find answers in all things. We ask that an edge of protection be put around all of those on the phone and all of the light workers and them that are on the front lines in this battle for our rights, for the love of humanity, for the resurrection of the goodness of this country. We ask that you would give us insight and understanding we know that this is a war of faith and a war of spirit and a war of virtue and righteousness. Give us these noble qualities where which we can wage a righteous fight for the goodness of the lives of the children and the members in this country. Bless this work and bless us to rise up to overcome all evil. In your holy name, Heavenly Father, we pray in the divine spirit of the Holy Mother. Amen. 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 Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you. Get back at you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank, Good night. You. Thank you so much.